ladies and gentlemen, please get to your feet and put your hands together for an out loud welcome of our keynote speaker, James O'Keefe. Oh my gosh. Baby, let me. I did it again, so I'm gonna let the. Oh my, baby, let me love you down. There's so many ways. I love the song. Maybe I can break you down. I love the song. <laughs> OMG by is it Usher? Usher, and I think I have the remote somewhere in my pocket here. Um, Okay, there we are. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be here with you guys. Um, I, I'm really happy to present to you, kind of take you on a journey through some of the things I've, I've done, and, and uh, it's great to be with the, uh, the Atlas Society. I picked up the pocket guide to the Fountainhead. I read that book a few years, five years ago for the first time. Uh, Howard Rourke, the architect. Some people have said, some of the things I've been through in my life compares to his journey. So I'm going to take you on a little journey today. And Steve, I don't think I have the clicker with me. So if we could just uh, go to the, go to the computer and maybe just go through it step by step, I'm going to take you on a visual journey through some of the things I have been through over the last five years. And I hope that by taking you on this journey, it, thank you embodies some of the things you guys have read about and believe in, and, and then maybe we'll do some Q&A. So here we go. OMG. That's a double pun. First of all, it's my name, O'Keefe Media Group. Second of all, some of the things we expose make you go, oh my gosh, right? It's crazy. And they can't censor it, right? Because it's the most commonly used hashtag on Instagram. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. So I, 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 I could talk to you about a lot of things today. I could tell you a hundred war stories and I'll tell you a few, but the title of my talk today is the fight for the rational in the irrational world. So much of people often say to me, um, you know, what, what do you, what do you believe in? What's your political philosophy? You know, who are you going to vote for? Um, what, what we do, what I do is I try to empower citizens to, to copy me, to be copycats. But I actually catch people on tape saying and doing things, and then they deny the things they're saying and doing. So it's almost like people say, what do I believe in? I just believe in, in, on in honesty and transparency and don't say something and then do the opposite. Um, some good news. Um, th this has just, just happened recently, so I figured I'd lead with this. This is me in Portland, Oregon, wearing a, a bulletproof vest. That's my attorney in Portland, Oregon, outside the federal building. It's kind of sad that journalists have to wear bulletproof vests in America. But we're fi we filed a lawsuit in federal court three years ago to change the law so that we could record in the state of Oregon, because it's illegal to record in the state of Oregon. It was. Um, that's us with Andy Noe walking to the courthouse. There, this is at 10 a.m. All the Antifa were still asleep. They were burning down buildings, like, but that was at like 11 o'clock at night. So we went early in the morning and filed the lawsuit. And uh, there was a law that prohibited me from recording in Oregon a few years ago. Um, and uh, we made these arguments before a federal judge. And the federal judge ruled against us. So we appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is considered to be, someone's laughing, like, you're right, the Ninth Circuit would never side with James O'Keefe, right? And and overrule a federal judge. Actually, they did just a couple weeks ago. So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the federal judge in Oregon, and now it is legal to record in the state of Oregon. Now, that, that's, that's an amazing thing that happened, but, and again, I'm bringing up the fountainhead. It's been five years since I've read this book, but the amount of pain and anguish and money raised and defamation and obstacles that it took for my team and I to do this is beyond what anyone can fathom. Um, not to mention, and again, dealing with the lawyers is its own type of hell. I've been sued so many times in my life. 
And that's how you kind of know that, like, if they really had something on me, they would have they would have uh, leaked it because I've been deposed twelve times, reversed and remanded. Accordingly, we conclude that the statute is facially unconstitutional. Usually, when they strike down a law, it's like, well, we'll keep part of it. You know, no, no, this whole thing was struck down on the grounds it's unconstitutional. Circuit judge out of Pasadena, California. Quote, we conclude the law is content-based restriction that violates the First Amendment right to free speech and is therefore invalid on its face. It's very rare to see that out of the Ninth Circuit. Okay, I could tell you many stories like this. Real quick story, this is out of New York, where I'm from, New Jersey. We did a story back in, um, back in uh, uh, I would say, November 2020, featuring a guy on tape in his vehicle... This is a Minneapolis man, and he's, he's got ballots all over his car. His name is Muhammad, and he, he's talking about using these ballots. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all these ballots, and I'm going to hand them in. Now, in Minnesota, it's a crime to have in your possession more than three ballots, but Muhammad's got dozens, so it's a crime. Now, I didn't film him. He filmed himself on Snapchat. He, the guy recorded himself with all these ballots. I publish the video that he recorded of himself. And I put the video on YouTube for the world to see. I did not covertly record the man. I did not put words in his mouth. It's him recording himself. And the New York Times runs a, run, runs a front page story saying that, that what I've done is part of a, quote, coordinated disinformation campaign. <laughs> I'm not sure what they mean by that. I didn't coordinate anything. I put no disinformation out. I put the man's own, but this is what the, and I know you all know this, but I think it's important to, to talk about it. If for no other reason, it's an obstacle, an impediment to the progress of the mission of what we're all trying to do, which is to get the truth out there. Let's see what they say. Quote, this is the lead, front page above the fold. Quote, a deceptive video released on Sunday by the conservative activist. First of all, what's deceptive about the video? He filmed it. I don't know what they mean by conservative activist, James O'Keefe. I don't, I don't know what about me is conservative. Which claimed through unidentified sources with no verifiable evidence. It's literally the guy on tape. It's his video, and he's named because you could see his face. So far, everything in the first few sentences of this article is a complete lie. It's literally the opposite of what, of what you're seeing unidentified sources with no verifiable evidence that the campaign collected ballots illegally and was, this is my favorite part, quote, probably part of a coordinated disinformation effort. So they didn't even have the balls to say it was, they said it's probably. Who determines that it's probably part of a coordinated effort? Is that just a way of, of them minimizing their libel risk? <laughs> so this happens, I've been doing this for, you know, I'm 39, I've been doing this for 20 years. So this is three years ago. So I'm 17 years into my journey. And even, I, I looked at my general counsel, and I was, in my, I was like, I can't believe this. I can't, because the New York Times does this. And this video was, you know, the number one video on the internet. And USA Today works with Facebook and used the New York Times article to ban the video because According to experts, the video is propaganda. So they removed the video on, online. So I'm sitting back and I think, what am I going to do? I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to deal with this, this, this propaganda, this, this nexus. And I look at my general counsel and I just say, okay, we're going to sue the New York Times for defamation. We're going to sue them. We're going to sue the bastards. And I file a lawsuit in New York against the New York Times for defamation. I'm destined to fail, right? It's impossible. I'm taking on a Goliath. There's no way. Well, I'm one of the few plaintiffs since 1964 to win a victory against the New York Times in New York court on motion to dismiss for defamation. This sent shivers down the New York Times' spine. Because while I've been deposed 12 times, there's one thing that the New York Times fears more than anything else, and that's being deposed. 
because they have a lot to hide, don't they? Okay, so we file this this um, this this thing in court, and the New York Times goes back and forth with our lawyers. This is pretty interesting. The judge in New York says, "Quote: These sources resoundingly describe Project Veritas as a partisan zealot with a history of distorting facts, running cons, misleading videos." Well, this is the judge in New York. While this is a lengthy media list, polling does not decide the truth nor speak to evidence. And the New York Times has not met their burden to prove that the reporting by Veritas in the video is indeed deceptive. The New York Times threw 700 pages, 66 exhibits, four briefs. The Times could not disprove our videos. And this is another favorite quote. I'm quoting the judge in New York, declaring us victors in this libel lawsuit on motion to dismiss, quote, New York Times argued that their statements describing Veritas as deceptive were mere opinion, incapable of being judged true or false. <laughs> However, if a writer interjects an opinion in a news article and will seek to claim legal protections, as it stands to reason that the writer should have an obligation to alert the reader, including a court, that they may need to determine whether it's, in fact, opinion that it's opinion. So the New York Times put in the first sentence of this article that the video was deceptive and then said, oh, it's just our opinion. Well, guess what? USA Today relied upon the New York Times' statement as a fact. Okay. So then, this is in one of these motions. It's amazing in these lawsuits how much money the lawyers make. I go into the room and there's just binders and binders of documents. I mean, just bind. They've got every email I've ever written. And I, when I sued my insurance company, it was even more than that. It was literally rooms filled with documents. Unverifiable expressions of opinion are not actionable. That's what the New York Times said. Okay, so then this gets appealed to the New York Supreme Court Appellate Division. And then the New York Times, I don't think that the New York Times actually thought that we would read these documents and put them, but what we do is we take the legal memorandums and we make YouTube videos out of them and we put them up for the world to see because you can't make this stuff up. It's like a Saturday Night Live sketch. The New York Times, this is the appeal. Remember, we've won a trial at the district court. Now we're going to the appellate division. The New York Times lawyers write on page 45, remember, we said the videos were not deceptive. The judge said, you haven't proved that they're deceptive. And you haven't, and the verifiable thing, remember the New York Times said, no verifiable evidence. So we sue for libel. The New York Times' defense in the New York Supreme Court is, quote, first, neither the word deceptive nor the word verifiable has a precise meaning that is readily understood. So now the New York Times is trying to suggest that words don't have meaning. How does that work? This is the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. Words don't have meaning. So one of the questions you'll ask me at the end is, James, how do you deal with AI? How do you get, what, are they gonna make fake videos? Don't you people understand that for 100 years, the newspaper men have been, have been shoving this, this ri ridiculously worded crap down your throats? They've been manipulating language for generations. Manipulating video. They've been manipulating language, and they've been doing it without any accountability whatsoever. AI, they've been doing this for generations. Now, it cost us a million, two million dollars to get to this point, and unfortunately, right in the middle of the zenith, the apex of this fight, I was removed as chairman of Project Veritas. Right as I was slaying these dragons and conquering these hills and raising lots of money, although I had to take black cars around the country to do it. That was one of the things they used against me. So he takes too many taxi cabs around the country to meet with these people to raise all this money as part of the Kafkaesque reason why I was removed. Perhaps why some people draw the analogy to Howard Rourke. And I never, I never... We never did this to get money. We raised the money to accomplish these things. So let's go back to the book 1984, which is the year I was born. George Orwell writes, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two equals four. 
If that is granted, all else follows. The truth does not need any explanation. It only needs to be seen. The best exposés, the most powerful things, don't require explanation. They just are self-evident. And that's the thing that is the greatest threat against them. Take this example. This is a, um, one of the most powerful videos I think I was ever involved in. This involves a union official in New Jersey, a Trenton guy. He looks like he's out of the cast of The Sopranos. He does not know he's being recorded. He thinks he's speaking to a, a, a person who abused children. And he tells him to cover it up. This is David Perry. Get the volume up if we can. I don't know if we have sound here, but um, he's talking. Oh, there it is. If he comes to me tomorrow, I'm going to think. Here we go. This, let's do it from the beginning. He says, quote, if he hit the kid, he hit the kid. It is what it is. All right. Listen, if you hit the kid, you hit the kid. It is what it is. He needs to not tell a soul about this. Mm. Nobody. If this, if nobody brings it up from school, I don't say boo. If he comes to me tomorrow, I'm going to date it back to the day after the incident. A will call me and says, we're going to do a head investigation about a kid. Went to his mother. The parents are complaining now that this teacher threatened him. His friend was mm -hmm. like, whatever the case may be. Uh, okay, I got this, but I'm going to let you know right now he came in the day after, even though he didn't. I would say he did, okay? So after a certain point, the camera is like... Are erased. Exactly. That's why I would never want to bring it up. The longer we wait, the longer there's no there's no. Oh. It was tough. We reverse it onto the kid. Okay, now, that makes if you sense. go to the Hamilton Board of Education and report this, they're gonna they're gonna call the police and they're gonna call parents and all that. We don't do that. We don't do that here. I'm here to defend even the worst people. I'm here to defend. We reverse it onto the kid. I'm here to defend the worst people. We erase the footage so that no one knows. One of the remarkable things about this footage is that if you look behind him, it says, it says families and schools working together. So this is the head of the teachers union in Trenton. Again, looks like sat Saturday night live sketch of what a union official would talk like. Right. So and there's more of these videos. I don't have time to, to play them all. They, they would shock you if I showed them for you. And perhaps, again, I'm just talking about the fight of rationality versus irrationality. This is the Michigan teachers union. This guy was caught on tape saying that a, 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 a student was basically raped by the teacher and there was an allegation of this, but rather than investigate it, the union in Michigan paid off the teacher $50,000 and swept it under the rug. So we did this whole undercover thing. Our undercover journalist was a volunteer, went in there off the street, got these documents, making these allegations. These are secret documents alleging all types of sexual abuses against children. Well, the Michigan AFT sued me. Forget this. Breach of fiduciary duty. So the teachers union was making an argument before a federal judge that I owed a fiduciary duty to the teachers union. James O'Keefe. You might be saying, what the hell? Exactly. I don't know. None of it makes any sense whatsoever. None of it makes literally any sense. It's so crazy. But this is the world that we live in, where they're stirring First Amendment op-eds, the Columbia Journalism Review about how unjust this was. No. They said, off with his head. This is Politico. Teachers Union gets restraining order against O'Keefe video. By the way, nothing in the article talks about what's in the video. They don't even mention the video. The fact that they were able to get a restraining order against an American journalist is unprecedented. So much so that literally a few days later, the judge granted a victory of us over the restraining order. But how did it even happen in the first place? And why are the unions trying to cover this up? In fact, this is a fresh area for investigation, education, the unions... I'm working on some things in New Jersey right now, but this is really an, an example of abuse of power. I'm going to sk skip some of these so things here because I want to get through some of the more recent stuff. Another thing you may have heard about is the FBI raid against some of our journalists. 
This involves the matter of the president's daughter's diary. Ashley Biden is her name, the sister of a guy named Hunter Biden. He's been in the news recently. I would suggest the Biden children are deeply troubled. And, right, to say the least. Um, so someone tips me off about a diary belonging to the president's daughter. And um, so we get this document. And the problem with the, with the document was we tried to verify the document. Because if someone sent you a document, you would have no way of verifying. And the difference between journalism and propaganda is the discipline of verification. You got to make sure you're a hundred percent certain that it, that it's real. That was the first issue. The second issue was we didn't know that what Ashley wrote in the document actually happened. For example, she could have been addicted to drugs and in a rehab, and she wrote some scribblings in a diary. And it, so, so for that reason, I chose not to air the story of what's in the diary. And I will not tell you what's in the diary, but you can Google it. Other people published it. Well, it turns out I was a better journalist than I thought I was because the FBI seemed to authenticate the diary for me because on November 5th, 2021, how many of you here have been raided by the FBI? Raise your hand. No, but you, you've been raided by the FBI? Oh, you were just gesturing. <laughs> I said, how many think it goes like this? <laughs> um, so here's what it's like. Here's, let me take you. What's that? You're on the list. That's right. Now you are. Now you are. You're here. And there's probably an FBI person in the audience. Which one to use the Fed, huh? So here's what it's like to be raided by the FBI. First of all, they did it to my colleagues two days before. So at 6 a.m., you hear, you hear like you're, you're in your bed. I'm not a morning person. So at 6 a.m. on the dot, you're... And it's the loudest pounding. It's not like... Or usually nowadays people go, no, it's, I mean, it's so loud that you're just, uh, and you're shaking out of your bed. And, um, and then I knew, I said, okay, that's the feds. You just know, it just sounds like it. It sounds like the feds. They have a battering ram, like the Vikings. <laughs> they have a big black battering ram. I don't know why they need a battering ram at the home of an American reporter. Maybe they need battering rams against the cartel. Maybe they need, maybe they need battering rams against the teachers union for the rape and, and covering up child abuse. That, that could be a battering ram situation. But a battering ram. They had 10 agents with guns and mag lights. So when you know, it's pitch black, you know, I, I run to the door and the, the, first, the first thought that occurred to me in this situation was, they're gonna break down my door. I don't want them to break down my door because I have to replace the locks. So let me open the door for them before they use the battering ram because they're giving me the courtesy pound. So I go to the door and, I, and then I, I, I reach for the doorknob and then I think, again, this is happening in like a split second. I think, if I open that door the wrong way and like gesture, they might shoot me. So I say, I say, you know, it's the FBI. It's like you would, it's kind of like the movies. It's not dissimilar to that. And I say, I'm going to open the door now. And I open the door and there they are. And it's just like a scene out of Close Encounters, big white lights in your face. And then they turn me around, they put me in handcuffs. I think I'm under arrest. I did not know that when the FBI executes search warrant, they put you in handcuffs. And they proceed to go through my home. And this is what it was like because my colleague or one of my colleagues ha has a video recording of this happening to them. I'm sorry, so what is this regarding? This is a search warrant. Open up. Let me get your hand. Let me get your hand. My hand goes. So for the next hour or two, they go through your apartment. They oh, pick up things and put them down. And, um, they give you a search warrant signed by a magistrate judge. Yeah. 
I don't know why we need 10 agents here. And it has a deterring effect, doesn't it, on other people? Because they go, oh, I don't want the FBI to raid me. Obviously, that's what its in effect is. But there's a slippery slope with that, isn't there? Throughout history, when people go, oh, I don't want to lose my whatever I have. I don't want to lose my mortgage. I have children. I don't want them to be put in handcuffs. Like, by the way, they didn't put, just put me in handcuffs. They put my loved one in handcuffs, too. And it's not a comfortable thing. It's quite terrifying. It's a sword of Damocles when they do this to you. Because, And here's the other thing they did. By the way, how many of you in the audience, because the first thing that you would probably do as, um, as people who, like you are, you'd say, I want to talk, talk to my lawyer, right? Of course, that's what you say when the feds come talk to you. That's what I would recommend you say if the police talk to you. How many of you have your lawyer's phone number memorized by memory? Do any of you know, first of all, some of you probably don't need to talk to your lawyer very often. We have like 20 lawyers uh, involved in my deal. None of you have your lawyer. So, of course, where is your lawyer's phone number? It's in your phone. So what do you do? You ask the federal agent if you could use your phone to talk to your lawyer, which is exactly what I did. So the federal agent says, yeah, you can call your lawyer. You would like to use your phone on your nightstand. I said, yes. He said, okay, you can use your bathroom to make a private phone call to your lawyer. So he let me in my bathroom. The door was ajar. And I called my lawyer. It's now six. It's, not, it's 10 after six on a Saturday morning. Nobody is awake. So it goes to voicemail. And the moment that the phone goes to voicemail, the FBI agent snatches the phone out of my hand. It's been unlocked. And then he changes the settings to make it not go to sleep. And then he puts my iPhone in an evidence bag. It was a ruse. Some would say the feds don't, they can't jailbreak an iPhone. Some would say that's true. Some would say not. But they did it. They did it. Now they have the, my iPhone and the contents of my iPhone. Now, I don't break the law. Never have, never will. It's one of my ethics principles. However, I want you all to think, all of you, if, you, if I were to go through your emails for the last 15 years, let's say you use G G Gmail, Google Mail, many of you do, or iPhotos, many of you have your photos. Is there one embarrassing email that you've sent? One embarrassing text, maybe to a girl or a guy? Have you ever taken a photo of yourself? I've never taken a photo of myself below the waist. But is there anything in your life that you've ever done that's embarrassing to you? Of course there is. Of course there is. And many people do break the law. And there's a book called Three Felonies a Day. Some would argue that all of us break the law in some way, matter, shape, or form. I don't break the law, but many of us do. Now imagine a world where they do this to anybody for any reason and then leak it to the New York Times. Within minutes of this encounter, within minutes of this encounter, I'm sitting on the floor in a state of shock because I can't believe that in these United States that this could happen. Yes, they did it to Julian Assange, but Julian Assange is not an American citizen. Yes, they did it to Edward Snowden, but Edward Snowden's a, a, a source, not a, not a, not a, uh, the chairman and founder of a media enterprise. Within minutes, I got a text message from the New York Times. I had my iPad still. They didn't take the iPad. They took the iPhone. I don't know how that works. And the, the text message said, Hi, I'm a national security reporter for the New York Times, and I understand that you have been given a search warrant. How does that New York Times reporter know something that no one else... I haven't even looked at the damn search warrant yet. He's already telling me what's on it. So there's, a, there's a, now a conspiracy between the New York Times and the Department of Justice? Well, the way it ought to work is the New York Times should be investigating the Department of Justice, not working with the Department of Justice to investigate investigative journalists. <laughs> and, 
and we just and 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 we just it all it's all just accepted. It's just the way that's the way it works in the country. That's how it is. And if you do anything to challenge this, this is what happens to you. And because everyone in this room has an embarrassing text message or photograph or personal email, nobody will do what I do because you don't want this to happen to you, right? But then perhaps some of us say, excuse my language, pardon me. Some of us say, fuck them. I don't care if it happens to us. They want to leak that photograph of me in the frat house from when I was 19, let them. I don't care. There are some things more important than my pride, than my shame. There are some things more important in the world. And then they, and then they say, oh, I have children. Well, guess what? I say to the people, say, well, I have children. I, 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 I'm afraid of the world that your children will grow up in 10 years. I'm not sure that there will be a world for your children to grow up in. I'm, I, I pity your children if you do nothing. I'm terrified of the world. Your children might be holding bayonets or whatever the modern version of bayonets are. I don't know what World War IV will be fought with. Rocks. So that's not a really good excuse, is it? Um, the search warrant, and again, I could tell you so many war stories. This is just a few out of a hundred. The search warrant said, this is what a search warrant looks like, because indeed, Article Three courts require a magistrate judge to sign it, although some say that those judges just are rubber stamp factories. They don't even look at the probable cause. You need probable cause to issue a search warrant. I'd love to know what the probable cause is, but we can't see it. Why? Because in the Article Three criminal defense, they seal it until there's an indictment. And guess what? No one's been indicted. Search warrant said, again, you can't make this shit up. The search and seizure are related to violations of, quote, conspiracy to transport stolen documents across state lines. Let me just, I'm just going to read that again. Conspiracy to transport stolen documents across state. You know what that's called at the Washington Post and the New York Times? That's called Tuesday. That's what journalists do. They transport documents, often stolen by somebody else, across state lines. And sometimes they email stolen materials across state lines. So is every time the Washington Post emailing a stolen document, should the FBI raid their apartment? This is crazy. We all know this is crazy. Even the New York Times is like, whoa. And the reason they were like, whoa, is because they're afraid it's going to happen to them. Self-preservation. So what is the philosophy of, what is, what, is our philo what is my philosophy here? It's not politics. It's not public policy and who, should you, who you should vote for. No. It's something more fundamental. We oppose doublethink. Doublethink is the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them at the same time. It seems to me that this is what we're fighting. Literally, something cannot be itself and its opposite simultaneously. That's the role. That's the role of OMG. That was the role of Project Veritas, and that's our mission. I'm going to have to skip through a lot of this because I, I, I wanted to spend more time on, on, um, on one or two things rather than go quickly through a lot of things. This, this is just anecdotally, I've actually been arrested by the FBI twice in my life. The first time, they, they, I was in a senator's office and uh, I was in Louisiana and I was recording someone in the office this is a public office, open to the public. The government arrested me and said that my colleague was, quote, alleged to have waited outside in a car with a listening device to pick up transmissions. That sounds quite nefarious. Sounds like he's got a bunch of equipment and wires. It almost sounds like he's part of the Watergate burglars, right? <laughs> well, it turns out the affidavit that the FBI used to justify my arrest about listening devices, 
the guy in the car with the listening device to pick up transmissions, it was actually just an iPhone. So the thing that's in all of your pockets, the FBI had an affidavit saying that it was a listening device. And the media ran wild with it. There was a, on page like 57, a year later, a retraction from the Columbia Journalism Review about the whole thing. But that's, that's just, it's so Orwellian. It's crazy. The guy actually resigned. The U.S. attorney who came after me resigned. It became a verifiable footnote in my life. But the, what, I, what I have learned about the world, even the world that we currently live in, is that the world is round. That a lot of these people do get what's coming to them, uh, even even more more so than you might think, because what what I've learned about these these sorts of people is that they tend to push too far. They 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 get greedy. Um, this is the U.S. attorney who came after me. Jim Letton was his name, and I actually I actually confronted Jim Letton uh, some time ago, and he literally threw my I gave him my book. And he literally threw the book at me. It's pretty wild. You're a nasty little cowardly spud. All of you, you're hobbits. You are less than I can ever tell you. You are scum. Do you understand? New York you Times. prosecute your case, asshole. New York Times bestselling book. New York Times bestselling book. It talks all about it. I recused. I recused. Here. I recused from your case. Threw the book at me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. You're violating federal law. You spend your life as a snail. You do weird little political things. Your horse's ass. <laughs> this is a federal prosecutor. <laughs> this is the lead U.S. attorney out of Louisiana. So he, he was fired by the Justice Department for, get this, his office was leaking, uh, going online and blogging about me for the New Orleans Times Picune anonymously in the comment section which is against the law for a federal prosecutor to do. So he resigned in disgrace. I tend to hold a crazy mirror up to people. I tend to bring the worst out of bad people. And then the guy gets promoted to be the dean of Tulane Law School. So this is recorded outside of Tulane. And then, no, I'm not making this up. This guy actually called the police and he called the FBI as I was, I swear to God, Outside on the public street in New Orleans, Louisiana, he had and the police officers stood behind him. It was like, yeah, that's right. You throw the book at James O'Keefe. Can't make it up. Can't make it. Here's another thing you can't make up. I'm just going to quickly one or two more anecdotes. This is in Washington D.C. Ten years ago, I'm, I'm taking you back. I'm taking you back to the old school beginnings of Project Veritas. Some of the things that uh, you may not have seen, or maybe you saw many years ago. This is. Attorney General Eric Holder, then Attorney General of the United States, head law enforcement officer of the country, he says, whether he's right or wrong, I don't know and I don't care, but I would like to make people abide by their own rules. Eric Holder says, photo identification at the polling location is racist. So you're not allowed to ask anybody to see their ID. You're not allowed to check because it's racist, okay? If that's what you believe, let's hold you to it. So we go into the location and we say that we, we that, that me, I am Eric Holder. Would, would I get Eric Holder's ballot? Now, Eric Holder at the time was a 62-year-old African-American guy. My colleague is a 23-year-old white guy. Let's see what happens. The Attorney General of the United States, as you know, is a 62-year-old black man named Eric Holder. But last week, a bearded 23-year-old white man went to Holder's voting precinct here in Northwest D.C. and was offered Holder's D.C. primary ballot to vote in that election. Do you have an Eric Holder? H-O-L-D-E-R or D-E-R? H-O-L-D-E-R? That's the name. There. I actually forgot my ID. You don't need it, it's all right. I left it in the car. As long as you're in here. You're on our list, and that's who you say you are. Okay. I would feel more comfortable if I just had my IDs. All right, if I go get sure, it, I'll well, be we, back faster than you can say furious. We're not going anywhere. There it is, like, faster than you can say furious. So that's the juxtaposition of the reporter and Eric Holder. That doesn't look very similar. Um, 
Now, Holder was called to testify about this whole incident in Congress, about his ballot being offered out to somebody else. He was made to feel quite uncomfortable. I wanted to also ask you about your reaction when you saw the video of the young man who claimed your ballot here some months ago and uh, your reaction reaction towards a requirement for a photo ID after you saw that video. You know, I mean, it's uh, an attempt to show something, I suppose. Yeah, very, very uncomfortable moment. And then people started changing the law. Now, this is the funny part. After this, the Precinct 9 in Washington, every election, the poll workers are now given a picture of Attorney General Holder with the real Eric Holder scrawled on it so that this doesn't happen. So it's literally Animal Farm. One rule for me, different rule for thee. Photo ID is bad for everyone, but I need photo ID. See, you're sensing a pattern here? It's the lack of equality before the law. Okay, I'm going to tell you one more quick story. i got to skip all this fun stuff. I'm sorry. I don't have enough time. I could spend hours, I know, but I, I'm already 40 minutes in here. and I ha- Oh, i got to talk about Epstein real quick, real quick. Just a real funny. Two more quick stories. This is the Jeff Epstein story. An ABC News person, let's call them ABC Deep Throat, comes here, here, comes to me, with a recording of the anchor on a commercial break. Remember the, who remembers this story? Not, not too many of you. Okay, good. So you haven't seen this. Amy Robach, then the lead anchor for Good Morning America, is being honest into her lab mic. They wear these microphones and they talk honestly. It's funny how they project themselves to you and then on the commercial break they become normal people. And she's talking about how the president of ABC News told her not to look into Jeff Epstein to protect the British royal family who ABC News is close to. I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. Um, First of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, Then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, We were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate it will say, oh, that we that, that also quashed the story yeah. and then um and then alan dershowitz was also implicated in because of the planes so she told me everything she had pictures she had everything she was in hiding for 12 years we convinced her to come out we convinced her to talk to us um it was unbelievable what we had clinton we had everything i i tried for three years to get it on to no avail and now it's all coming out and it's like these new rele- revelations and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God, we, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Other women backing it up. Hey, yep. Brad Edwards, the attorney three years ago saying like, aunt, like we, there will come a day when we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And, I had it all three years ago. So this comes out. It's remarkable how these people talk in when they're actually being normal people. And and this comes out, and it was a huge story. ABC actually issued a statement, which I'll get to in a minute. But it was one of those stories that brought the left and the right together because I think we all agree that that's wrong. That, that, and particularly ABC is owned by Disney, which is a children's company. So there's a lot of irony there. So someone, even like Ocasio-Cortez, who's no friend of mine, I don't, I don't mind her. I don't have anything against her, but... Even she tweeted out the, the video here, but then I retweeted her, and she unretweeted the video after I did that. Sure, their hatred for me exceeds whatever marginal appreciation they have for principles, which is a badge of honor. It's like stopping O'Keefe is more important than even their own, you know, crusades. So she, they put a statement out, you know, and, and, you know, it was like a gun to the North Korean head. Um, and they, she said that, uh, I don't know what, what they offered her in terms of money, but she said she was caught in a private moment of frustration. Okay. All right, let me tell you one more, one more story here, just, just to close it out. Um, recently, I was removed from Project Veritas. Uh, I'm just going to skip through these slides here to get to this part. Um, and this was about... This is back in, um, I want to say, January 27th of this year. I was uh, doing a story on, wait, not this, not this. Do you, here we are. Is it Pfizer. Now, thank you. 
Someone said that. You read my mind. Um, now, when we grow up in America, we turn on the TV and we see commercials. And it's kind of like in, ingrained in our consciousness that this is normal. But I recommend a book by Noam Chomsky called Manufacturing Consent, which I quoted a lot in my book, American Muckraker. You see these things and you take it for granted, uh, the media and the commercials in America. America is brought to you by Pfizer. CBS Health Watch, sponsored by Pfizer. Anderson Cooper 360, brought to you by Pfizer. ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Pfizer. Making a difference, brought to you by Pfizer. CNN Tonight, brought to you by Pfizer. This week with George Stephan. I mean, do you, do you think that if, <laughs> do you think that these guys could actually investigate Pfizer? You think they're allowed to? Like, let's say I was a young cub reporter and I worked for Mr. Cooper and I was like, hey, I've got this unbelievable memo inside the company saying they're lying. What do you think the odds of them letting me do that story are? So in many ways, you're captive. So it leaves someone like you or me completely able to investigate all these sacred cows because there's nobody. I mean, you can't do a story on Pfizer if you're them. It would... You'd be taking away the, your bread. So along comes this guy, Jordan Walker, who works for Pfizer. This was the most watched video I've, I've ever produced. It was viewed like some 100, 150 million times on the internet, Twitter. And this is the guy who's saying that they're mutating the virus, but don't tell anybody that we're doing it. And that's when our undercover reporter says, could you say what you just said exactly the way you said it? And then he says, our product is bad for the country, but don't tell anybody. And this virus originated in a lab in China, in Wuhan. This is what he says. I know what you're, gonna th I know what you're thinking. This is a low-level guy. No, no, no. He works high up in the company. So he says all these things. He's the director of mRNA planning. So how many of you saw, saw this video? Raise your hand. So it was a lot of you. So good. So we'll take you through this little journey of me confronting this Pfizer executive and then and then sort of I'll talk about the implications of this. Hey there. Is this seat taken? What? Hi. Um, you work for Pfizer. My question for you is why does Pfizer want to hide from the public the fact that they're mutating the COVID viruses? Is this real life? So this guy's this about to go through the five stages of grief in two minutes. So the first stage is shock. What is going on? What is happening? Where am I? This is what this guy, no one, by the way, they used to do this. I, we got, at least we have some young people in the audience. Usually I speak, everyone's over the age of 60. Before I was born and before you were born, some of you, Mike Wallace used to do this. He stopped. ABC News used to do this. Uh, Diane Sawyer in 1992, she stopped. They figured it was too risky. Now, uh, now, as I'm confronting this guy and he's going through this stage of shock, what's remarkable about this moment is I picked the one pizza restaurant in Brooklyn, New York, where there's actually a picture of Jesus on the wall. And the Pfizer executive is looking up at Jesus in a state of shock. And our cameraman is filming. This is actually through glass. He's outside looking in. And the, the, I swear, the Pfizer executive is looking up at the wall, looking up at Jesus for a solid five seconds. And it goes on to the next stage of grief. Bro, first of all, I'm literally a liar. He says, first of all, I'm literally a liar. <laughs> That's what he says. Let's, let's listen to that again. Bro, first of all, I'm literally a liar. I'm literally a liar, he says. But believe everything I'm saying to you right now. Let's see what happens next. I'm not even a scientist by background, you know. What and I came from a consulting firm right. that does business. And this please, is please, absurd. Please don't touch me. So this is absurd. So, so call the cops here. Like, please do call the cops. Then he says he wants to call the police on me. This is what a lot of people often do when they're confronted with their own words, not my words. They're, it's, they're literally looking at a mirror, okay? They look at a mirror of themselves and they call the police. That's, that's, that says something, doesn't it? We hold a mirror up to these people. And that's more powerful. I want you to remember this, if you remember nothing else. Holding up a mirror to these people is more powerful than you expressing your opinion about those people. 
Every day you turn on television, you go on YouTube, you go on Twitter, you go, and all it is is a bunch of influencers telling you what they think. But what if we lived in a world where you could hold up a mirror to what they think? So what does he do? He calls the police. I swear to God, he calls the NYPD on me. I'm used to this, by the way. Literally, I show up and people call the police. Sometimes they call the FBI on me for asking questions. I'm not even a scientist by background, you know. What I came from a consulting firm right. that does business. He wants the cops here, but he doesn't want me to leave. So I'm in a little bit of a predicament because she's asking me to leave, but he doesn't want me to leave. So what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? And then things start to get weird. He starts getting really aggressive. Door. Get him. Why don't no, no, we stop? Stop. Please unlock. Please unlock the door. Please unlock the door. Lock the door. Unlock the door. These are the people in your government making medical decisions about your families. I know what you're thinking. That's just a low-level guy. No, no. He went to Yale. There's a staff chart where he reports to the guy who reports to the CEO of Pfizer. He worked for Boston Consulting Group. He's no shrinking violet. And he's on the floor of a restaurant assaulting me. And what's remarkable about this moment is when I do these things, I have the video clip on an iPad to show him. He takes the iPad and he's smashing it on the ground, smashing it as if the only location of that video is on that particular iPad. It doesn't exist anywhere else. <laughs> it's, a, it's only on that iPad. These are the people, these are the experts. But it's not up to the media, is it? It's not up to the journalists. You can't rely upon any, you can't rely upon the media. You can't rely upon the government. You can't even rely upon anybody else. The only people that you can rely upon is yourself to expose these people. You have to build something. Our cameraman gives him a little shove in, in self-defense. <laughs> We're trying to get to unlock the door. Unlock the door. I have to drag. <laughs> I have to. I have to drag my journalist out of the place because she's so much adrenaline is rushing through her veins trying to capture this on video. As I walk out into the Dumbo neighborhood in New York City to try to hail a cab. We're we're in New York City. This is remarkable. And we're walking down the street, but I realized that my car, my, the, the driver that's supposed to pick me up, he's not there. He's not parked where he's supposed to be. Now, my, the cops are on their way, and we know how it goes when James O'Keefe has interactions with law enforcement by now. They usually take the SD chip and they destroy it. And then it's my word versus his. And we know how he is. And Lord knows what irrational statements he's going to make to the popo. So I'm trying to get the hell out of there. But my car is not where it's supposed to be. And then to my shock, I look around the corner and Jordan Walker is standing in front of my car, blocking the vehicle that's supposed to pick me up. This is insane. He thought <laughs> he was trying to block my car from picking me up. Oh, man. I, I ran through the streets of New York trying to find there's no yellow cabs. It's midnight on a Tuesday or Wednesday. And I had to walk 20 blocks, finally get into a car, go home, publish the story. If you Google the story, Google actually said it looks like the results below are changing quickly. If a topic is new, it can sometimes take time for reliable sources to publish the information. So if you went on the internet and tried to find this, you couldn't. But something, and I want to end on a very optimistic note. I'm not a pessimist. We're all going to die. Newsflash. But I'd rather be an optimist. I'd rather believe that there is hope. Because I know that there's hope. You know why? A few days after this story came out, I was removed from my position at Project Veritas. This happened January 27th, February 6th. There was a board meeting, and I was removed 
I was the founder and chairman of this organization. I spent my life building this organization into what it was. And it was a very, I'm not going to lie, it was not, it was, I'm not going to say that it wasn't painful because it was. But after this story came out, a whistleblower who gave us the documents inside Pfizer showing who this man was, identifying who he was, verifying who he was, well, that whistleblower was unwilling to go public. But after what happened to me, she decided to go public. And that's her, Debbie Bernal, the woman who brought you the Jordan Walker story as a consultant for Accenture. She was responsible for working with Pfizer. And she was inspired to go public as a result of what happened to me. And there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, reason why she would do that except because she believes in something these principles she believes in something and in fact there is a movement across the country of people like her happening everywhere across the country citizens taking it upon themselves to pursue the truth it is in I, there's a lot of parallels to the fountainhead um, I should reread the book Howard Rourke we do not do this we do not do this in order to obtain clients or to obtain money. We obtain the money in order to do this. It is a means to an end to expose what needs to be exposed. My mentor, Andrew Breitbart, who died 11 years ago, he said, walk towards the fire. Don't worry about what they call you. All those things are said about you because they want to stop you. But if you keep going, I was talking, I was going to pause in the quote, I was talking to a Medal of Honor recipient and he said, How, what do you do when you reach your breaking point? How do you handle it? And he goes, just don't break. If you keep going, you're sending a message to people who are rooting for you, who are agreeing with you. They, they actually, most people agree, they're just afraid to say so. And the message is that they can do it too. If you walk towards the fire, if you keep going, because that's really what it's all about, right? So all across the country, there are these whistleblowers. And I think we're going to see a renaissance of citizen journalism. The, the, the self-reliance, the individual, the individual taking it upon himself to do the job of the collective. The individual doing the job that the government's supposed to be doing, the media's supposed to be doing it, and taking the abuse and stay standing. This is possible and it's happening all across the country, and I'm in charge of making sure that it happens more often in communities everywhere. OMG is the name of the organization, O'Keefe Media Group, whatever you wanna call it. It used to be called Project Veritas. It's the same thing. Sometimes these things happen for a reason, and if you're lying, cheating, stealing, scamming, or behaving irrationally, or saying something is, is something, and it's the opposite at the same time, we're going to expose you. We're going to make you famous. Stay tuned. Thank you. From everyone here at the Atlas Society, thanks for watching our content. Don't forget to give us a like and drop a comment below.